So Robert, you're now, uh, you're back at Clark. Uh, take your story now, uh, acclimating back to, to, to freedom and civilization and, and, and from that point on. Okay, well, it, it's gonna go pretty quick here. Um, at Clark Air, I was there for about three days, uh, got a uniform, got a haircut, uh, had our first meal. I think they started out uh, pretty light and then finally the, the guy says, no, we want it. So, I mean, we had steak and eggs, anything you wanted to mm -hmm. first meal at Clark Air Base. Uh, made a trip to the, uh, the, the Air Force Exchange. I believe I got, uh, I got some stuff from my wife, Pat. Uh, Estee Lauder or something. I forgot what they, what they, what they do. Uh, but anyway, so uh, uh, I jump on an airplane and I believe it was, I think we, we stopped in Hawaii and we got out and the guy that was with me at that point uh, says, hey, smile and wave. I guess I wouldn't smiling and waving before. <laughs> so we walk out to the, the, the red carpet and you know there's a bunch of people out there uh, and we're on the ground maybe for an hour or two and some of the people uh, come in and introduce themselves, you know. And uh, it was good, weird, but good, you know. And we get back on the airplane and this time uh, I was gonna go to Andrews Air Base because my wife lived in Philadelphia. And I do remember that it made a couple stop. One of them was in Norfolk. I think they dropped off Jack Fellows, and there might have been another stop. But we didn't get back to Andrews Air Force Base till after the sun came down. Oh wow! You know, and at the other places there was you know their family out there, the Greedham and all that. Uh, so we get to the Clark, we get to the air base at uh, Andrews, and there was a bunch of people out there. I think mostly, uh, if not all of them, my family wasn't there. Uh, but they were all like uh, from people that, that worked at the at the Andrews Air Force Base, and they were out there. And 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 I'm saying, what do I say? So oh, just you know, tell them you're glad they're out here. God bless America. So I get out, you know, and hey, really glad you guys showed up for me. God bless you, and uh, thanks again. And then he hustled me off into a freaking caravan of. I think there must have been nine black limousines, you know, and I'm in one, and there's some Navy captain or admiral in the back seat of. One of them, you know, and I look behind, there's a bunch of them behind us and the, and the red lights are going and, and we're heading to the Philadelphia Naval Hospital. And I remember him saying, well, these are for you, Robert. These are for you, you know, <laughs> kind of went right through me. So we show up at the, uh, at the Naval Hospital in Philadelphia and there's all this news media, you know. Someone sticks a, sticks a microphone in front of me and I, I remember saying, and I was congratulated on this, a few days later, uh, I says, you know, thanks guys. Uh, really would like to spend time with you, but you know, my wife is upstairs and I really want to get on with it. So that was it. Short and, and some people kind of like me snubbing the media. You know? <laughs> so I go upstairs and uh, my wife is in the room and she looked great. She looked like the day I left. You wow. know, I know she wrote me a letter uh, before I came home. Says, well, we have to talk about some stuff, and it was like the marriage was over. You know. Mm. And, uh, you know, that was kind of hard to take. But sure. anyway, so I give her a hug, you know, and she says, well, your, your brother's downstairs and his wife and your mom and dad. And she says, be warned, uh, your dad's not looking well, you know. So we call him up, and this is, we're at the top of the hospital there in Philadelphia. And I can hear this, <gasps> it's my mother. She sounds like a porpoise, you know. Mm. And she's all emotional, and, and, and they walk in there. And I got to tell you, my dad, he looked like he was 100 years old. You know, mm -hmm. when I got back, he, I think he was, he was with 50 years old or something like that with Minneapolis Honeywell. He was a sales executive. And when I came home, he looked like he was 100. He was like 57, you know. My mother gained 40 pounds. My brother looked great. Jan looked great, his wife, you know. And the Navy brings in this humongous platter of freaking food and stuff, you know. And we're in the room. I had, a, I had a living room and a, and, a, and a bedroom and a bathroom. It was kind of a suite, mm -hmm. but it was nice. Yeah. And uh, my mother starts talking about how happy she is and how her life is good. And it was obvious that she had just been miserable as can be, you know. Well, and my dad was a complete wreck. Uh, well, I can't take it. We're sitting there talking for about 20, 30 minutes and I find, excuse me, I go in the bathroom, I just cry because it basically just wiped out my freaking family. Yeah, you know? right. And uh, 
So I, you know, I get that cleaned up, you know, five or ten minutes. I come back out again, and then we just start talking, you know. And the rest of it went pretty good. And then I started getting tired. I mean, it was late at night. And so they they left. And I, and then I think Pat left after that. And it was pretty apparent that our marriage was done, you know. And I'm feeling pretty bad. And I look. Uh, it was the only thing that separated me from the street was a screen window, you know, up on like the 17th floor. It was way up there, I think even higher. So I look out the bedroom window, you know, and I see Pat walking across the parking lot to get into her car, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, it'd be just so easy just to jump out this freaking window. And then I thought about my brother and my parents, and I said, well, wouldn't that be bad yeah. for them, you know? So that was the only moment I ever mm. even considered that, you know. Uh, nurses came in, took a bunch of blood, my vitals, all that stuff. And then about two hours later, I can't get to sleep. And I said, hey, I'd like to talk to my brother. In fact, Wade, uh, Carl Wade, what was his first name? He, he was a redheaded guy, a Navy helicopter pilot. He was my escort, just a terrific guy, him and his wife. Uh, he was assigned it, and I'll tell you one thing the Navy did good was they really matched my escort with me as far as personality and, and background and all. I mean, he was terrific. They were both terrific. Mm. So Wade's up there, you know. I said, I want to go talk to my, you know, my brother, you know. Well, Rich remembers, and he gets the call, hey, your brother wants to see us, so him and Jan come over. And he remembers Wade telling him. He says, look, he says, uh, talk about anything you want. He says, but he didn't want to hear opinions. <laughs> and my brother's thinking, well, how do you talk without giving an opinion? <laughs> you know? But that, my brother told me that later. So they come up, and we had a nice talk for a couple hours, finished off the food. You know, I was feeling pretty good. And then uh, I think the next morning, uh, it was time to go shopping. So we go to the Navy Exchange. And there's a bunch of clothes and stuff there. I don't have a clue. I don't know. I think I did buy a pair of white and red striped, uh, what do you call it, uh, double, uh, what's the name of that? Bell bottom pants. Uh -huh. and Corduroy. Double bread. What, 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 they had a name for that yeah. stuff. I forgot. A leisure suit. Pardon? A leisure suit. Yeah, maybe that was it. But it was, it was, there's a different name yeah. for it. It okay. was a fad. Oh, you know? okay. Yeah. And it was pretty apparent. I didn't know what the heck I was doing, <laughs> right. you know. But Pat says, I think the night before, well, if you need any help, just call me. So Wade called her and said, hey, he needs some help. We're going to go shopping. Uh, you know, this might have been a day or two later because they really wanted to restrict me to this hospital for a couple weeks. And uh, so we uh, somehow, uh, we got together that evening and went out to Cherry Hill Mall. What a circus. You had all these guys in super fly outfits, you know? Everything was super bright. I read yeah. later that once you're in prison for a while, everything is kind of muted. And when you get out, everything is just super bright. Oh, wow. But I was attracted to the candle shops and the record shops with the beads and oh, stuff, right. you know, and the colors, wow. the super fly guys, <laughs> you know? Uh, that was a real hoot. I can remember I bought a pair of Forsham's and I picked out the ones they fit, got fitted, you know? And then it was like, okay, now what do you do? I had to watch someone go up to the cashier and pay. Oh, that's what you do. So then I went up there and I had some money, you know. But everything you had to do one time, everything. Really? Wow. Everything you had to do one time. And then, and then, and then you get it. Yeah. There's a real quick relearning curve on stuff. Well, that was, that was Cherry Hill night. And... Uh, over the next few days, I think Pat said, you know, it's just unfair that you spend all... She had a boyfriend. Uh -huh. And uh, she said, it's just unfair that, that uh, you know, you, you got, you know, well, you know, things are starting to warm up a little bit. And I think after a few days, a week, whatever, uh, we decided we we're going to try to make a go of it. Well, we get remarried by the minister there. I forgot his name, but he, there was a huge scandal with this guy. He was a Navy chaplain. I don't know what it was, uh, but it was, oh, this is the guy we got remarried. Oh yeah, he's the guy that, you know, but it, 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 it was, it, 
I think what it was is some people were, were really trying to put it to him. They didn't like him, yeah. and, and they were wrong, and he was something like that. I can't remember his name, but anyway, it was just something I remember. Uh, so uh, the next couple of weeks were pretty, I had my, my, my fingers out. I walked around with a finger <laughs> for six years, you know, and then the Philadelphia Naval Hospital, uh, I had an operation and, and they were able to give me 90 degrees work on it, but I was, I was in a cast up to my elbow for like six weeks. Mm. Uh, that worked out okay. And then I think we started getting on the road. We went down to, um, oh, I got my license. I think we visited my mom in, in in Lakewood, Ohio, Rocky River, Ohio. She she'd been a nurse, and uh, uh, she says you want we're out. She says you want to get your driver's license. How do I say? Well, I'm a member of AAA. So we go to AAA. He says, hey, here's my son. You know, he's on the newspaper. He's a license. They gave me a license. You know. <laughs> well, the 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 driveway from AAA goes right out on the Clifton Boulevard, which is like 65, 55 miles an hour. And it's like eight lanes of traffic. So I get out, hang a left, and then all I did was just try to stay in the one lane and, and keep, and all these cars are starting to go by me, you know. I mean, it was life-threatening. And slowly things, I sort of went through this after my first cruise. It took a while to, you gotta learn how to drive again. Yeah, wow. Know? wow. Anyway, so I learned at 55, 60 miles an hour. And we got we, we made it back to my mom's place, so I had my license. Uh, I remember my mom and I we went out to have dinner. I can't remember where Pat was at the moment, but this is a story I like to tell at the end mm -hmm. of my talks. Um, we went out to have dinner at, at a steakhouse here in Rocky River, just my mom and I. And they bring the steak. Of course, I ordered fillet. And I'm cutting it, I'm eating mine. I'm about a third of the way. My mother, she's just sitting there looking at her steak, you know. And I go, Mom, what's wrong? I mean, it's a great steak. And she says, well, she says, you know, the whole time you were up there, I could, I could not eat a steak like this because I did not know if you were getting enough to eat, you know. Uh, and sometimes that, uh, I'm doing okay today, but when I tell that, sometimes it tears me up a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Well, at any rate, uh, so I get my driver's license, I go back to, I think, go back to Cherry Hill, a uh, bunch of crazy stuff. You know, Ford lets you use a car for a year, uh, you know, we got free tickets to Disney World for a day. Uh, maybe I was ungrateful, I said, well, you know, why don't they just give us the car? <laughs> uh, at any rate, uh, so I want to fly for the airlines, uh, they wouldn't give me the time of day. I think he interviewed, uh, American was decent. Uh, do you think but, they were concerned about your background? Your, no, they just weren't hiring. Yeah, oh, yeah. East, Eastern Airlines said, uh, they wrote me a letter, due to your ordeal, apply in another year. You know, I mean, just mindless stuff. Yeah. Uh, Delta wanted me to go through the flight program again. Uh, American, I, I, I passed the physical, and then they wanted me to go down to Dallas, I guess, wherever they're headquartered for the rest of it. But I was so crushed with the, uh, the letter from Eastern that I said, screw it. You know, and the Navy was saying, we'll send you to school in Monterey, California. Ooh, that sounds nice. You know, because I only had two years of college. Uh, bottom line is uh, we went out to Monterey, California. We lived in Fort Ord uh, for a few months. Uh, and then uh, we moved, uh, we bought a house in Monterey. Both my boys were born in Carmel Community College. Eric, Eric was conceived at Fort Ord. Uh, and that was, uh, that was, uh, that was that, you know. Uh, I finished up there, got a, be in international relations, a master's in business. I applied for the master's, but they turned me down and said, we need to get you in a cockpit or you're not gonna make commander. Hmm. And I says, well, you know, I really don't care about that. I'd rather get an MBA, you know? So I think he said, well, you'll be jeopardizing your chances of command, something like that. So we finished up there and then the Navy uh, wanted to send me to Washington uh, Air Systems Command as an auditor. I said, I don't wanna be an auditor. So well, we got this slot in Meridian, Mississippi as a comptroller. He says, I'll take it. I had no idea about Meridian, Mississippi. <laughs> so we show up there, I'm the comptroller, there's only four people could tell me what to do. And after being in the slammer for six years, a low guy on the pole, yeah, that was that was a big part of that decision. I didn't want to go through that again. Uh, so we're in, in, uh, in uh, Meridian, uh, 
Well, I guess it was a few years. Uh, we, you know, we argued a lot. We had a Doberman pincher. Uh, it was probably post-traumatic stress that I'm finding out very recently that arguing is part of that program. Uh, but at any rate, uh, uh, you know, our Doberman pincher, 70 pounds worth, she, she would hide behind a sofa. And I'm thinking, well, what is that doing to a two and a four year old? Oh, wow. And I remember that I grew up in a family where my mom was Catholic and my dad was an alcoholic and God, I mean, he would beat her within an inch of her life and I just didn't want my children to go through that. Maybe that's my excuse, you know, but uh, so we separated. And uh, in Meridian, uh, Pat moved to Virginia Beach. Uh, she met someone uh, shortly after we separated in Mississippi and they got married a few years later. Uh, we had some issues uh, with visitation and that kind of stuff for a while, but we got that straightened out. Uh, it was real expensive. <laughs> it didn't happen real, real quick, but we got that straightened out. So, and then I retired in 1983. I went down to Florida to sell securities, did not do well at that, about a year or two, and then I got hired by Dun & Bradstreet to manage money. It's doing pretty good. I was offered a position in marketing, and I consulted a good friend of mine, was the executive vice president, he said, Bobby, he says at 44, uh, kind of like to get started in sales and marketing, and then my other buddy, uh, uh, he was uh, he was a, one of their sales whatever managers and he says look he says uh, it's going to take you six years before you can do D and B any good he says by then you'll be like 51 he says and you'll be competing with people like me that are 33 you know so make your own decision and during this and the reason I did this was because I'd been applying to law schools I got accepted at Stetson. And at the University of Florida, I was in the hold pool with all the other old people, you know. <laughs> and uh, I pretty much decided that if I can't get in the University of Florida, I'll, I'll do the marketing. Because that's the most expensive, it was like 11000 a year. Whereas University of Florida, if you got it, you couldn't afford not to go. It was a state school, you know, 700 bucks a quarter a semester, something like that. Well, I get into the University of Florida. And... Uh, I believe I got in the January 1987 class, and I was on probation the first semester. That was an experience, and then I then I started getting B's, and I graduated in December of 1990, and looking for a job. My father died in 1991 in August, and then I got on with. Uh, Prosecutor's office in Orlando. I prosecuted DUI for a year and a half, did other crimes for about another year. And my blood pressure started to go up. So I went back, of course, I've been going back to Meridian on spring break and all that stuff anyway. And Ms. Lowry, the deputy comptroller, she says, uh, she says, uh, you ought to go talk to those simulator people. They make good money. At the time they were making like 45,000 a year. So I went down and talked to Moose. He says, well, he says, it's 30 days or six months, depending on who leaves, you know. And uh, I got the call. I visited a couple times, I think in Thanksgiving or Christmas uh, of 65. He says, well, uh, when are you ready to come to work? I don't hmm. know. He says, January the 2nd. So I went there January the 2nd. It turned out to be the best job I ever had. I thought I'd be bored to death doing so, but it was just the most relaxing, non-stressful, and I was there for 17 years, left uh, June of last year, and bought a condo July of, 19, of 2012 here in Fort Collins, and the, one of the best moves I ever made. Yeah, I wonder. And uh, at the time, Eric was here with his four children. Uh, three months ago, my other son, Deke, moved here. They're all up on the wall. And uh, we have... Uh, Two sons, two terrific daughter-in-laws, and six grandchildren, all here in Fort Collins. So I'm a happy grandpa. Oh, wonderful. Uh, I, I sat for the real estate, I passed the real estate license, and and now I, I've uh, I'm signed up with, uh, joined the National Speakers Association and hope to take uh, my talk on the road. I know this talk takes a while, but I've got my talk uh, done about 17 and a half minutes now. 
Wonderful. And that's basically my story. The one thing I did want to say about Mike McCushton, is it time to talk about oh, that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the two things I like to end my talks with, uh, first of all, with my mother, and she's the last one I end it with. Mm -hmm. The second to last would be uh, Mike McCushton. He's, uh, uh, he's my first roommate. He's the one that uh, said the best airplane he ever flew. He only got seven missions. Uh, he was a golfer. And he played with Jack Nicholas. I believe he said Jack Nicholas was a jerk on his <laughs> TV persona, but he said he's getting better at it. This was back in 67. Well, Mike, uh, he got wrapped up uh, by Crooked Eye, you know, and he had the same thing with me. He wasn't talking. And so what they did with Mike is in addition to what they did to me was they took another rope around his wrist over his shoulder and then they put two manacles, shackles on his ankles and, and this 10 foot pole that was, iron pole that was up in the, uh, the knobby room. They would run that through and they'd take the rope uh, from his, his wrist and back over his shoulder, around the bar, over the other shoulder here. And then they'd cinch him up, cinch him up till his nose touched the bar, oh. you know. Well, he's sitting there. Of course, you can't breathe. You got claustrophobia, it hurts like heck. And he's got tears coming down, and Crooked Eye looks down. He says, just think Cushion. They called him Cushion. He says, just think Cushion. This is but a speck in the annals of time, you know. Well, he still wasn't talking. Mike was a tough dude. Uh, so they, uh, uh, one of the guards goes in, they flip that iron bar, flip him over, and it's not carpet. I mean, it's, it's raw concrete. And he comes down that concrete. He says, that did it. He says... He says, untie me, I'll tell you anything you want to know. Well, the trouble is, before they could untie him, they had to flip him back <laughs> right side up. Uh, but anyway, you know, it, it's funny now. Uh, it wasn't so funny mm -hmm. then. Uh, another side story with Mike. Uh, his nerves, he was a golfer, and, and his left hand is the power hand, and, and like the nerves to his fingers from being tied up in the ropes and all that, uh, they had damaged him, and, and he was real worried about, man, Mike golf, because he was a scratch golfer mm -hmm. in college. And uh, he was worried about that, but uh, that eventually came back. And the other thing with Mike is, is he would do uh, touch his toes every morning, you know, and do stretching exercise. Well, one, one morning he reached down to touch his toes and he stayed in that position for about a month. He had something in his back crook, crook so he's walking around uh, like an like a ape, you know. That's pretty much my story. And how, how have you come out of it physically? Do you, do you still have any... Uh, well, I found out, I thought I just had a couple broken yeah. fingers, and I thought that uh, I just had a twisted here. I know that my neck always felt, a, you know, when I get down to my, my fighting weight, I can feel some grinding here on my neck. I don't think I could handle another ejection, you know. And then I was measured at the VA about six years ago, and the lady says, well, your right shoulder is one inch lower than your left shoulder, you know. So, and I do remember that when they wrapped me up, in Hanoi, that's the second time I got wrapped up. I go back to my cell, and when I went to put my arms up, I could only get the other one wouldn't go any higher than this, you know. So it was either an ejection injury, or when they wrapped me up, they did some damage. And what it was, uh, I was checked when I came home. They put a bunch of needles. I have a wing scapula, which your shoulder blades are held back with muscle and the muscles are controlled by the nerves. Well, the nerves in my right one, at one point were 75% damaged, so that, so that when I went forward, my shoulder blade would wing out. Uh, you, if uh, I'm in a swimming suit, you can yeah, see it, you know. Yeah. But over time, that grew back, so, so I, can, I can get my arm up now, you know. Uh, with these fingers, uh, uh, you know, I'm not gonna be bowling, but I was never, I bowled, I, I was not a bowler anyway yeah. after high school, yeah. you know. I just did it in high school to meet women. <laughs> uh, that's pretty much it. And then I found out really only two years ago, uh, they were taking x-rays. I go to Pensacola every year for a physical. And he throws up the, you know, uh, uh, x-ray of my back. He says, look here. I have a disc in my neck and a disc down here that the bone, the, the vertebrae is okay, but the disc, they should be rectangular. Well, these two are like triangles, which means they've been compressed. One up in here, one in my lower back. 
He says, those are classic ejection injuries. You just have a compressed disc. I have never had any back pain. Now, my mother had back pain. Uh, it was mostly spas, muscle spasms, but she had two spurs, which I have from birth. But they've never bothered me. You know, knock on wood, yeah. I've been real lucky. Um, physically, uh, I'm good. Uh, you know, I'm just happy to be alive. Yeah. Uh, thing, things. Uh, and you, you'd kind of uh, talk just slightly about uh, PTSD. Do you, uh, how's that uh, psychologically? How how are you feeling? You say you feel great. I mean, well, you recently, know, so that recently the, the, come the up. hard thing with PTSD is you don't know if you have it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I never. And to be honest with you, I've had I had the, there's Tom Collins, Colonel C Collins, Air Force, lived in Jackson. He's a, from Jackson actually. He lived in Reading for a while, then he lived in Jackson. And him and his wife were saying, man, you need to get to the VA, get to the VA, get to the VA. And I kept putting it off, Yeah. you know. And finally, when we had 9-11, uh, the government was handing these people millions of dollars to their family. Millions. Yeah, yeah. I says, well, shoot, I'm going to go to the VA. And I got disability. Wow. You yeah. know. Uh, uh, so... Uh, but and, and and yeah, I've got some PSD, and uh, I mean, I think I'm normal. Yeah, yeah, good. good. <laughs> yeah. You might have another, you know. <laughs> I'm sure my ex-wife doesn't think I'm normal. <laughs> Bless her heart. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that that's. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. That's anything else? Uh, uh, I'm just not wondering if you have any sort of closing statement you'd like to make to to to, oh, wow. to, 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 wow. to Well, I left a lot of stuff out. Yeah, I know we've uh, only know. that's the thing. I know we only got the tip of the ice. Right, but, right. Uh, I mean, I have actually talked to Hewitt Clark for six hours. Yeah. And I talked to my boss and his daughter for six hours. Uh, Bradwell Scott, who wrote my initial manuscript that the Navy didn't want published, uh, I have. As we speak, I have 50 hours on tapes. Wow. He did over a six month yeah. period. I will tell you that uh, Hewitt Clark, who wrote uh, about the civil rights killings in Mississippi in 1963, in Philadelphia, Mississippi, he was a Mississippi boy. He had to leave Mississippi after that book. He lives in Houston now. Uh, they were after him. Uh, he sat down. The book was War Stories from Mississippi. He covered all wars, Civil War, etc. Uh, World War, you know, all of them. Mm -hmm, Korea, mm -hmm, World War mm -hmm. II, F, all this stuff. And he covered Vietnam. In Vietnam, it was me, Tom Collins, and John McCain. People don't realize John McCain, I think he was born in Mississippi. Mm. And in those days, the older son ran the business and the younger one goes in the military. Well, John was the younger one. Something like that. Okay. Uh, but uh, he talked to me for six hours. He says, Robert, he says, the only exciting part of your story is the first week. Hmm. And he's absolutely right. I mean, it was boring, boring, yeah, yeah. boring, boring. Yeah. I describe it, uh, the last three years was a country club. People don't want to hear that. The first two months was a nightmare. The two and a half years in between in those... You know, 12 by 12, 15 by 15 rooms with nothing to do but twiddle your thumbs. Uh, I counted the, the squares on the ceiling uh, like people count sheep, you know, eight hours a day. Mm. Boring. Ugh. It was like law school, just your basic miserable existence, uh -huh. yeah. time in between. Yeah. But that's kind of how I sum it up. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I'm grateful. Yeah. Uh, I could say some things, <laughs> <laughs> you know. You know, people think that uh, the Vietnamese tortured me 24-7. You know, well, if if the treatment was as bad as people say it was, none of us would have come home alive, okay? Uh, I can tell you the death rate in North Vietnam was like 1%. We had uh, about 500 people came home. I know of six people who died while I was up there. Uh, the death rate for the soldiers who were captured in South Vietnam was 50%. Uh, we had 100 showed up. Uh, uh, you, you got to trust me on the numbers. Uh, they say, uh, you know, our government says 15% of the Vietnam POWs died. Well, if you run the numbers, uh, 100 of those were from freaking South Vietnam. Yeah, you know? yeah. um, I'm grateful. 
Oh, very good. I'm grateful. I mean, it could have been so much worse. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people don't like to hear this about Jane Fonda. I have, I have Tea Party people who agree with me in Florida that if it wasn't for Jane Fonda and, and uh, the anti-war people, we'd still be up there. Uh, that's probably politically incorrect, yeah. although I shared that with a person, uh, Army helicopter pilot, and he hugged me. Really, huh? Like, yeah. it, it was, he, was, he was at uh, the V-Bahn meeting breakfast uh, Friday morning. He was a helicopter pilot, like my brother, and uh, he says, I like you already. Yeah. You know? I mean, there's, there's so much. It's all politics, but yeah, anyway, yeah. That, that probably doesn't belong here. It'll be in my book. Yeah, very good. Well, Robert, I want to thank you for sitting down to, to tell your story today, but uh, just as important as well, I want to thank you for your service to our country.